try to cover a lot of topics. And then this year, one of the goals that I had was, uh, let's talk about some of these Gnostic saints uh, that we have. Some of them we know, some of them we don't, you know, some of them we're more familiar with than others. And to segue with a previous conversation about the litany of sovereign pontiffs, uh, if I could reinterpret that conversation, uh, I find that, and, and I'll explain, there are two parts to our liturgy where it's just a list of names, okay? And the first list of names is called the Litany of Sovereign Pontiffs, and depending on what event, what Sunday you go to the liturgy, it's shorter or longer depending, you know, so, but what that is is the list of the Sovereign Pontiffs and Patriarchs throughout, like a legendary historical list throughout, um, that shows the, the lineage of St. John down to this guy, okay? So, um, and as we have explained in our earlier uh, presentation, that those guys aren't saints, okay? Like, you, uh, they're, they're, they're definitely flawed and not the epitome of what we represent as a spiritual uh, entity. So if I could reinterpret that, though, I find that the first list are, is in respect to those who, who carried on uh, Gnostic and specifically Johannite lineage external. Okay, they had the title, they had the hat, you know, but that didn't necessarily mean that they had the spirit. Okay, the second list happens in our Eucharist, and the second list is uh, a mix of, of saints, and uh, they are really saints, and and I find that, and and I divide them into two kinds. They're the saints with holy cards and the saints that don't have holy cards, okay? <laughs> so, um, and, and I find that that list of saints, one, are not necessarily individuals who would ever identify themselves as Gnostic, okay? Like, externally. If you actually went up to St. Teresa and said, well, what you're experiencing is Gnosticism, she went, no, no, that, no, not at all. Um, so they didn't, they didn't necessarily have to embody it, uh, externally, but in reviewing their life and their spirituality, we find that they've had this Gnostic life and Gnostic experience, and so that's why they're in there. Uh, that's why the apostles are in there. The apostles never can call themselves Gnostics, you know, um, and they didn't even call themselves Johannites because John was still around, you know, <laughs> like, you know, so, um, but, but they embodied these Gnostic points of views. So, when Choosing out of the second list, because I wanted to learn about the saints, I divided them up. I said, let's let's look at some of the ones with holy cards, because I'll probably find much more easily accessible information, because the Catholic Church supports the ones with holy cards, so they'll generate a lot of information. And in a holy process of discernment called eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which is liturgical Greek for something, I don't know, but we landed on St. Teresa, okay? So I began, my, I began my preparatory research before uh, wanting to get into this. And I was expecting to do like a one hour presentation. This is St. Teresa and move on next month to the next thing, you know? But when I started researching St. Teresa, I was like, oh, I, I need more time. I need more time than an hour to do this. This is a little deep. And so we quickly turned that process into a book study, okay? So I took her seminal piece of work called The Interior Castle, and we all got either PDF copies, it's, it's, it's out of copyright, so you can totally just steal it from online, and, uh, or get it free from one of the iBookstores or whatever. And um, so people had physical copies, and we started to read it. 
got together in my family room, sat around, opening Invocation of the Angels, Liturgy of the Logos, opened the book, and we start reading, and instantly, we were all like, really, Terry? Really? Like, that's how you want to be? Because, like, so, because she starts off saying, well, she starts off saying, one, this book is not for the laity, it's for my religious sisters and the, and the ones who are in the order with me. I can respect that, okay. And then she says, two, I wish that somebody else was writing this. The only reason I'm writing this is because I was ordered to by my superior, and I wish somebody else would because uh, I'm a stupid woman. And, and we were, we, instantly, the whole parish was like, girl, please. So, uh, like, you know, so, and so she continues on to that a little bit, and then she starts talking about what's going on, but she, but all of us are having this, this struggle reading this text, because it's like every other paragraph, she's like, now, somebody with a penis could probably explain this better, but, okay, and then she goes on. So, I said, I didn't want us to have to swallow this week after week. And, you know, and I felt like I might have, like, lose some members if we kept doing this. So I said, <laughs> let's stop reading this book for a while. We'll do something else. And this is around the same time that the Conclave call started happening, and Sean was asking, uh, what, what, what are we going to do for presentations? And I said, well, I just started this whole thing with St. Teresa. In six months, I'm sure this will be fine. So I started to do it myself. And because I'm a martyr like that, I'm like, I'll read this horrible book for you. Okay, like, so, <laughs> so I started to read the interior cast. I tried to chew it, I tried to digest it, and I just could not get past it. And a big part of that was because I come from a, I come from a Catholic background, and a lot of it reminded me of this, this uh, and I know how much St. Teresa is revered in the Catholic tradition. And so the, it made me think, like, oh, this is that Marianology, humility and submissiveness, and you know, whatever you whatever you ask, do unto me, and you know, that kind of thing. And and I just couldn't appreciate that. I was like, I've already, I've been there, done that, moved on. And um, so I couldn't really have this true appreciation for the interior castle. So I switched gears and I said, let me read something else. And I read her first real published book, which was her autobiography, which was another book that was ordered that, that was ordered for her to be written. And the tone was absolutely different. And I went from going from girl please to like girl please. Okay, like it was a totally different experience. And so the point of my presentation is that I really want to encourage this this the, the reading of this book. Uh, and the reason why I want to do so is for the same reason that Father Anthony just said. It has that same visionary ascent process tied to it. But I didn't want to promote this book and then you pick it up and say, girl, please. So, um, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that I learned from reading the outside material of it and then talk about how much I think the interior castle is not a a submission from some woman who's just been beaten down, but is a brilliant and inceptive way of her having a voice in a society and a culture and a church that did not want to hear it. So, and uh, in order to do that, we kind of have to know a little bit about where St. Teresa was from. Uh, St. Teresa was born in the midst of 15th century Spain, and uh, 15th century Spain was dominated by Orthodox Catholicism and the resurgence of the Spanish Inquisition was happening at that time. Uh, the culture at the time was this, this direct result of this long 800 year war between the Catholics of Spain and the Islamic Moors who had taken over the Iberian Peninsula at the time. And, um, you know, they went back and forth, you know, the Moors won a little bit, and then the Catholics won a little bit, and then eventually the Catholics, through the support of all the other European countries that, that were under this Catholic banner, started to push the Moors away. 
and the uh, Christians were creating more of a majority in the Iberian Peninsula, and it started to create a lot of conflict. And at this time, there were, on any given day, there could be a riot between uh, Catholics and Jews, or between Catholics and, and the Muslims in the area. And all these riots actually were very violent, and they reportedly uh, resulted in the extinction of a third of the Jewish population of that area just through this rioting. Um, the, you had the option, you had the option to um, leave, you had the option to die, or you had the option to convert. And, and uh, so over 100,000 Jews in just a short period of time converted to uh, Catholicism. They were actually the main focus of the Spanish Inquisition and of the Catholic royalty at the time, were, were these Jewish denizens of Spain, and, and, and they were the focus of that more so probably than the Moors themselves. The Moors were more political, but I think the Jews were more personal in that manner. Um, and it's uh, King Car uh, Ferdinand II of Aragon and Queen Isabel I of Castile who are the same ones who gave Columbus the go-ahead to do what he did, um, that actually re-established the Spanish Inquisition at the time and to order to sniff out this heresy. And um, the Spanish Inquisition, not only did they go after uh, Jewish converts, they were also after this specific group of individuals that were becoming popular in the area, which uh, were called uh, Maradas, and they uh, were Spanish mystic women. And these Spanish mystic women were based, it was just the result of basically, you know, uh, having a Latin mass and, and lack of liter literacy amongst the lower classes and things like that. And it was just, a, and it was also a matter of, uh, at the time, mysticism was a big deal. Okay? Uh, mysticism by men was m much more acceptable you know, um, than women in that time. So this was a way that the women could participate in that inner contemplative life, uh, except it wasn't being led by men. So the Inquisition had a problem with that, and that was another group of people that they really focused on. And then, and then Protestants. You know, the newly, you know, Lutherans were around, you know, and starting to spread about. And St. Teresa actually has a line in the interior castle where she asks for the people to pray for the Lutherans. And, um, and I wonder if she actually really cares. You know, does she really want us to pray for the Lutherans? Or is this a line to show that she herself is not a Lutheran? Like, dear my superiors, I am not a Lutheran. You know? So um, I don't actually know if uh, St. Teresa actually had a strict, you know, line in herself personally about that. You know? So, anywho. Um... So St. Teresa, th that's where St. Teresa was born. She was born on March 28, 1515. Uh, both of her parents were very, very Catholic. Uh, the reason why her parents were very, very Catholic, oh, and, and I should go back a little bit. The Spanish Inquisition obviously used torture and different methods to get what they needed, and you know, a lot of times death or exile, but then they did use some less extreme issues. and. Um, one of them, one, well, there's a particular story of a man who was a Jewish convert, and the Inquisition uh, found him guilty of still practicing some Jewish customs and traditions. So they made him and his children dress in yellow every Friday with black crosses embroidered all over it and to walk through the town so the townspeople can spit at them and yell nasty things and those kind of things. They had to do that for nine weeks every Friday. What's significant about this story is that the man who had to do this was St. Teresa's grandfather. And one of the children that had to walk and experience this too was her father. And so this greatly influenced the, the Theresian household growing up, um, especially with the Spanish Inquisition now even greater in full force. Uh, they did not want to be considered defiled in any way. Also, there were laws about uh, converts and when they could start participating in government and church life to the fullest extent. So if you were, if your father was a Jewish convert 
you had like basically they had to wait three generations before they could hold public office or an office in church because kind of like getting that mug blood what reason out of you. Possi- yeah. What reason could they possibly have to, to suspect that the conversions weren't sincere? <laughs> That's pretty much saying, yeah, we know our method sucks ass, but Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well and we're gonna enforce it with force. Yeah. Yeah. So um, because of this experience, Teresa's father was very paranoid. Uh, he he did not allow visitors into the home. Uh, the only he could not keep out family because that was kind of the custom and tradition. And she writes that that was a huge anxiety for him because Teresa's cousins were just kind of flimpic girls who you know didn't really you know care about that kind of thing, and they talked about boys and you know all kinds of things that you know teenage girls in the fifteen fifteen should not be talking about. You know so. But other than that, he tried to seclude her as much as possible um, from this outside influence and because he did not want them to suspect because Teresa is directly in that line of generations of like, first of all, she's a woman. Second of all, she was very pretty. That was the other thing. Teresa was very pretty, so you know she's evil. And, um, <laughs> and like, <laughs> so, because, and, and, and she, she can read. That she, well, she can read. So she's witchcrafty. Yeah, she's witchcrafty. Well, and that was the other thing. And, and Teresa would write how she actually could use her looks and her charm to get things that she wanted. And her father recognized this in her, too, and was just like, this is not good. Like, he was just like, the, the, Teresa could have been either a nun or on the bad girls club, like like either one, and and the fa- and the father was like, I'm not having this. I'm not having this. Not after what I went through, and not after what I saw my family go through. And um, Teresa's mother, not not helping the situation. Teresa's mother dies when she when Teresa is 14 years old, and and all she has is an older sister, who's still living at home, and the father at the time. There were brothers, but that didn't matter. In, the, in that point. So Teresa's kind of on her own, you know, she's, she's a teenage girl with, you know, who just lost her mom, um, and it doesn't sound like that Macaulay Culkin movie. Uh, anyway, like Micro or something like that. And like, you know, like, but yeah, so she, she just lost her mom, and so she starts spending her time with these other cousins and girls and stuff, and, and she starts reading romance novels, okay? Um, they're called chivalry novels in her books, but they're really about knights and princesses and, you know, smooches, you know, and farting rainbows or whatever, you know, so, um, and she's really into her appearance. She talks about how she, you know, she really, she knows she's pretty, she knows she can get stuff for being pretty, and she goes with it. I find this really important because she won't admit it. But I think that she used those same tactics to do the things that she wanted to do as a nun, like build new convents and reform and orders. Father Michael, I need some help. Can you, you know, give me some permission, you know, like, you know to do this? And uh, and uh, she never actually says it, but but you know, if you're a little bit intuitive and as you're reading along, you kind of, and you, and you're reading the interior castle, yeah. and you kind of get that feel too, yeah. Um, so she she kind of has that. She's my role model. Oh, she's, she, she's, she's, like I said, I, I went from being like, uh, I don't know why she's on this list to being like, she's definitely on this list. Um, so her father enrolled her in this Augustinian convent where, you know, bad girls go, okay? Um, this was considered a, a, he tried to hide it. He waited until the older sister got married and so said, oh, because there's no other women in the house, this is not a good place for her. So we're going to send her to this boarding school, okay? But but in reality, Teresa said it was because she was starting to get a little, you know, fanciful, okay? But it so she went there and you know she was like you know just like any girl was just like Ugh, whatever, and um, but when she got there, she realized first of all Teresa had a habit of just making everybody around her like her. She was much a shapeshifter of personality and conversationalist and. And she found that the nuns took a liking to her. And she took a liking to them. And it was the first time that she ever really considered taking the habit, but she admits that it was not because she had an appreciation for the life or because she loved God. She was really afraid of what being a gossipy, vain girl 
would do to you in the afterlife. Okay, so she was, she had a moment where she's like, oh my god, I'm going to go to hell. You know, so I better be a nun. Um, I better take, I better start taking this seriously. And, um, and so she becomes a nun. Well, she actually runs away. She runs away from the boarding school, goes home for a little bit, uh, convinces one of her brothers to, become a, to become a monk, too. I don't know how long that conversation took, but, you know, supposedly in some amount of time, she convinced her brother, and they both ran away to another different uh, monastery, and they took him in, but the, the nuns wrote to the father saying, hey, you know, we can turn the Amber Alert off. We have your kid. Okay, so, um, and he was like, and she wants to be a nun, but we need your permission. And at this point, he was like, all right, if it's going to keep her out of trouble, then fine. And he approves of it. And it's shortly after, I mean, it's almost like weeks, you know, or, or maybe, maybe a couple months after she becomes a nun, that she becomes extremely ill uh, with what we now know to be malaria, okay? And um, malaria is completely treatable with the right medicines and those kind of things, but without the right medicines, it is a disastrous experience. And for years, St. Teresa dealt with having this malaria. She, uh, it started off with like headaches and tiredness, and it grew to just unconsciousness. Uh, she uh, experienced pain. She became catatonic for a long period of time. She's still a young woman at this point. You know, she she uh, experienced. Uh, she would, they said she would just become stiff, and she woke up many times with wax on her eyes because they prepared her for burial. They could not get her to wake up, and and it was in this time that two very important things happened for Teresa. One, she received a book of spiritual devotion called the Third Spiritual Alphabet. Uh, from a man named Father Asuna. And, um, and that became the only source of entertainment she had during this time. No, there was no hospital TV. You know, she just had this book. And it was all about the contemplative life and the interior meditations of the contemplative life. And then the other thing that happened was, and I don't know if it happened from bad medicines or from the illness or if it was just the open window that divinity came through but it was in this time that Teresa had her her visions her legendary visions and and uh, revelations and I kind of think it might have been both reading what she was reading and actually genuinely doing the practices while in a state of of surrender because when you're in when you're when you're wretched with malaria and they're just, you know, they're like, here, eat this rock, see if that works, you know. Um, you, know so, you know, you, uh, you know, so she, uh, I think there was a mix of those things, but I think that in the midst of it is that, that's whenever she received a lot of these experiences and visions. The most famous one was that she, uh, she woke up and uh, she uh, saw this seraph hanging over her with a, a long spear, and there was a flame at the end of it. And, and she, she said she felt Jesus around, but she didn't see him. And this, the angel just started to just stab her with this spear. She's like, my entrails started coming out, and I was filled with the pain of love. Oh, sick. Okay, like she had malaria. I forgive her for it, okay? So, so um... So she's in this constant chronic pain, and eventually one of her sisters brings her an image of the bridegroom, or and it's, or it's also called the Ecce Homo, and it's a it's an image of a wounded Jesus. He's all sad in the crown of thorns, and he's got the reed scepter and the purple sash, and it's called the bridegroom. It's basically like this is what your husband is willing to do for you, and and Teresa got up, because at this point she could not move. She, had, she would be bedridden, you know. And she gathered enough strength to fall onto the floor before that image. She said, I am not getting, I am not doing anything else until I get up off this spot. I refuse to stop praying to the bridegroom. And she eventually 
started to get better. I personally think that what happened was she refused to let people treat her anymore. And her body finally was like, all right, I can take care of this. You know what I mean? Like, and started to push that out. But um, I, I don't, because because every time they talk about the new treatment she would get, it would just get worse and worse and worse. And it wasn't until she actually cloistered herself off, said, stay away from me. I'm just going to lay on the floor and pray.